Welcome back to Legend Rouge Cycling Podcast for Pace Vasco Stage 4. We had another GC filled stage, 176 Ks from Santurzi to Santurzi. They did a loop. This is basically just finishing in the north of Bilbao near the port area. And we have one of the most technical descents in pro cycling into the finish, although it's preceded by a much more difficult climb than the other day to La Asturiana, 4 Ks. 9% levels off a bit, then a step descent down. Very technical, goat track stuff. And Aaron Brew won this stage before Benji, your man. How did you rate his <laughs> chances for today? To be honest, I, I looked at the parkour yesterday in the podcast and I saw those first four kilometers of the final climb, which were steep. And I expected a land attack. And I was like, maybe they'll respond to the land attack as they did in fewer days, in like the previous days where we saw the peloton kind of like crawl it back, but hey, spoilers, we might have had a bit more than a land attack on today's stage. So with that scenario considered, Aramburu probably wouldn't be fighting with the GC riders, but then again, he's clearly not helping Moss too well, is he? No, I mean, Movistar have been a little bit disappointing, I must say. Um, they did try some stuff with Guerrero uh, in the stage. Very odd. I can't really figure out what's going on. There was a... A breakaway with Tess Fazion in it. I thought mm, maybe he'd try to win this from a sprint if it all came back together and he survived the climb well, but he got in the break with uh, Jassom, Han van Hoeker, Kai Thedo, and Baron Netscher once again going for <laughs> KOM points. So break was pretty... It was managed pretty well, to be honest. Um, yeah, it didn't have too much of a chance. And all the run-ins to these little climbs... Teams are doing a lead out anyway, like Jayco, like Ineos. Even if yeah. they aren't bringing back to break deliberately, they are in effect keeping it under control. And it's not like it's like the major climbs that precede this uh this climb at the end, but they're a bit like tricky. They want to be in a good position going into it. So Plap was the one doing that for Ineos at one of the climbs today with like 40, 50 kilometers to go. But we all knew the action would occur towards the end, towards that final climb. But um, some riders unfortunately don't make that final climb. We had crashes. And there was a crash including nine riders, which included Lehmreise. But then someone noted that there was a second set of Velo bike there. No clue if that's related to the other piece of news that Rohan Dennis is out of this race due to a crash. Was that the same crash, a different crash? I actually don't know, but he's abandoning the race. And I'd argue that's still a hit for Jumbo Visma. He hasn't been the all-out god in the last three days. I think Walter was strong yesterday. Dennis was solid in the lead out for Vingega in stage one for the intermediate sprint. but. Outside of that, not too much notable when it comes to the Jumbo Visma team. Too much either throughout those three days. And then I look at stage six, which is that like brutal stage where you've got mountains throughout. And I'm like, well, medium mountains throughout, I would say. And I'm like, you kind of need a team to neutralize whatever is going to happen there because so many people are going to try and get in the break that day. Dennis wasn't going to be the all out guy that could keep it all together, but he could have helped a bit. So I still think this hurt their team a bit for that stage, no? Yeah, they already, you know, who knows how lame Riser will be after the crash too. The team wasn't already looking too crash hot, it must be said. Despite Jonas' great legs, he was having to position, position himself on a lot of the other stages. Uh, apart from Valtteri yesterday, he was very, very good. But the stage before, it was all Vingegaard having to do it himself. So this doesn't help. And we get toward the, the breakaway, I mean... No one knows where the intermediate sprints are in this race. Like, I feel sorry for the commentators because <laughs> there's no markings. There's no one kilometer to go on the road from what I can see. i also not convinced that this was where it said it was on the profile either. I kept expecting, like, here it is, here it is. And sometimes they don't show the intermediate sprint. Anyway, the break is... It's sort of dangling there, and no one wants to bring it back. Yumbo don't have the riders up front to bring it back, and I'm thinking, are these three guys just going to roll over? And it's Guerrero going for the bonus seconds, and I thought, is he going, like we said the other day, that Movistar are trying to keep three guys close in GC? Guerrero, Aaron Baru, and Mars, and he's going to take three seconds back for himself. Maybe, or is he just taking the seconds away because Mars doesn't want to sprint? But he jumps. He's followed by Izaguirre and Vingegaard. And Vingegaard cleans up Izaguirre in the sprint. 
And I think Guerrero might have taken one second. He ends up losing three and a half minutes this stage. So, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Monster, I wouldn't say, have played a blinder so far in this race. But Vingard's sprint, Benji, we're so used to seeing him get cleaned up by Pog that we forget, like, he has, and he showed yesterday, he, he isn't Lander. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> you're going a bit further into the story there already, but spoilers. <laughs> when it comes yeah. to Jonas Vingegaard, he he's so used. We're so used used to seeing him against Pogacar in those final sprints at the Tour de France, and we don't see him that often in sprints in one week races. But his speed is actually good enough to beat these second tier GC riders. And I think he said in an interview once that he actually thinks the sprint is pretty good, but that. He still looks at the Pogacar and Roglic's of the world to be ahead of him when it comes to those sprints. But hey, in a couple of years, that might change. You don't know that. Pogacar's sprint got better over the years as well. And Remco's definitely got better now, yeah. he, now that he has a medal year sprint in his pocket. But um, I would argue that what Guerrero potentially tried doing was stealing the seconds from ahead of them for Mas is potentially something I would see as an option there. But the issue as well is because he makes that move, he's indirectly getting the breakaway that was ahead. I do think that break would have been caught regardless of Guerrero going for it or not, because other people would have sprinted. So I don't know, maybe it affected the outcome. Maybe him sprinting for it, that reverse lead out that didn't, wasn't really a reverse lead out just for stealing seconds actually caused the peloton to take it. But in the end, think God takes three seconds. He's a gear eight two, like you mentioned there. And the next obstacle in the race, the climb. We're getting towards that climb and the first four kilometers of this climb is the steep. So we're expecting action there, but who has the team to do it? Yumbo doesn't have the team to really launch Vingegaard anymore at this point because two riders are crashed, one is out. And when it comes to other teams, Ineos is spend a bit because they spend a lot in like trying to keep themselves in position. Movistar isn't looking too powerful, mainly because of the fact that Aramburu, Guerrero and Maz don't really seem to do leadouts for each other on climbs. So it's not like I was expecting Maz to get launched by Aramburu or anyone else here. So Groshan has crashed for McNulty. Yeah, exactly. Another example. And the team that came to the fore was uh, the riders in pink, but not in pink, right? <laughs> well, yeah, we had Chavez pacing the start of the... And listen, I don't want to... You can't criticize teams for trying just because yeah. it doesn't work one time. That's wrong. And teams sometimes do, like... Lander got criticized, you know, the meme of Lander looking at the camera when they tried on Glier or Col de la Lowe's. Well, they had to try for him to move up. And maybe he could have been better that day. But looking at EF here, in what world is it the best idea for them to do a one, two, three, four full gas lead out on a steep climb based on the evidence we have of Carapaz's shape compared to Lander? Compared to Vingegaard at the moment on steep climbs, why is doing a, a hard lead up, blowing your team apart for Uran and Carapaz, the best option? And yeah. it isn't. It, it isn't. <laughs> there, we said it, I think I said it yesterday. Wait for the shallow bit, keep numbers if you saw the Aaron Baru stage win, and then that's where El Hagua can attack. Exactly. And not only El Hagwar, but if you get your numbers, you can roll attacks on that flatter part because you know these other teams have limited domestiques at this point, then they will even reduce even more on the steep section. It's all about trying to keep yourself safe and going on the further sectors on the uh on the somewhat false flat uphill after the steep section. And they don't do that. They come to the forward Chavez doing the first pull with Carapaz on the wheel, and then it seemed like I don't know who was the third rider. I know Ural oh, was Christian there. Christian Iking then came up oh, okay. and pulled, and then Chavez lost his wheel, left yeah. a gap, and Carapaz was furious and shook his head at him, like, "Bro, what? You just left the gap." And he should have let Odd Christian Iking go. Then he yeah. just followed him, and I was like, "This is going to end in tears, like in GP in Durain. And then Uran. on the weekend, Uran just hops past. There's a bit of a. It looked like an attack because the tempo had stalked a bit and Uran does a bit of an attack, it seemed like, but everybody's in his wheel. And then he just keeps on pacing. And when he goes off the front, we see, we see Karapaz making his actual move. And Karapaz's move is the kind of move where it's not accelerative enough to actually make a gap. So he's basically attacking with Vingegaard just following his wheel. And he's doing a lead out for Jonas, right? Accidentally? Oh, Vingegaard would have been loving this because <laughs> he doesn't have the team to pace the climb himself. 
like full gas like this, and EF b played Chavez, odd Christian Iking, Uran ups the pace, then Carapaz the whole time he's in the wheel, and then Carapaz just blows up, loses three and a half minutes, and Chavez loses. He only lost 46 seconds. That's pretty good from given where he was on that climb. And then Vingegaard just steps off them. Like, well, the best form of defense is attack, particularly when we're at the steepest part of the race. So he's sub 60 kilos. Probably he has the best legs here. This is the place to go. And he gets a huge gap. Felix Gold can't respond like he tries to. He looks the best. The Asia 2R rider. And Lander, once again, was just out of position or can't initially respond to Vingegaard's surge. He eventually bridges over to Vingegaard, still on the steep section, but everyone else is gone. Like, I think it was Izagira, Gol, Godu, Igita, and maybe Mars. Yep. Were, formed a group of on 14, 15 seconds initially, but they were all cooked. And Vingegaard was just in full gas pace mode. Exactly. So he's got that Landos bridged up. So they're now with two and they're flying it. Eh? They're flying it. This when the gap is significantly higher. By the time they reach the top, it's like 28 seconds and 29 seconds when they reach the top of this climb. And we see in the second group that it's not just those five riders. There's some riders coming back where, first of all, Knox bridge is over. And then a group comes back with a few more quick step riders with the likes of Buchmann and so forth. So Higita also has a teammate in this group now. And a bunch of like lone riders on other teams that are also McNulty. in that group, like Sean Poussin, McNulty, uh, Victor Langelotti. We got to yep. mention the Monaco guy because he's actually pretty good these last few weeks. And I'm thinking this first part of the descent is too steep, is too technical to actually use a team, right? That's where you just have to like fly through as much as possible because you have a team there like in group two, that's not going to matter, eh? If the first two corner as well as they can, and the second group, the first guy corners as well as they can, then the gap is going to be stagnated for now, right? Yeah, exactly. So, like, Vingegaard paces the whole shallow section of the uphill. Lander refuses to relay. The second they get over the top, Lander's to the fore. He's pacing, and they lose... They had 30 seconds at the top, 28 seconds. They lose no time on the, the descending parts of this finish, yeah. which is 15 case to the finish. In fact, Lander even takes three, four seconds back in the last part of this descent, which there's two parts of it. The first part is extremely slow, narrow, and is like, like they don't allow trucks on it. And it's, you know, I don't even think it's two feet pandas wide. <laughs> it's maybe three Vinger guards wide and it's like a corrugated cement surface. They're not taking the group behind, taking time back. It, the second part of the descent, they could have, but Lander will put on an exhibition. He put Vingegaard on a few gaps. Now, he was pushing. I, I don't think Lander was hanging around either. I think he was trying to induce a mistake from Vingegaard or at least put him under pressure. Um, and I think... Like both of them are good descenders, but Lando are just an outstanding descent. And that was still a, that was a smooth tarmac surface, thankfully. And still the group now with Catania pacing full gas for the Schmidt sprint win. Didn't take any time there. But it's all about the last four Ks where we have a little like highway uphills, um, which these drags where their being in the group is hugely advantageous in the last five kilometers. And Lando's not really contributing Benji, uh, which yep. I guess makes sense. It's up. Jonas is leading him by, at this point, eight seconds on GC. He's got a gamble if he wants any chance to win this stage. Exactly. And Landa did contribute in that descent part, like you mentioned. But once it got to the flat, especially the last two kilometers, Landa was in the wheel. And Vingegaard slowly but surely was like, oh shit, he's not going to take over anymore. Kept looking over his shoulder as the group behind actually got closer and closer because Catania and Knox are working in that group for the Schmidt sprint, like you said. But a question there. Bukuman is there with Higita. Bukuman once <laughs> again doesn't ride. <laughs> Worst yeah, teammate? <laughs> I mean, Catania was doing a decent enough job. I mean, the same could be said for Simon Yates, for Sobrero, who came second yeah. in the group sprint. Um, looking through the other teams to see who had multiple riders. But yeah, it's... <laughs> Yeah, that just is what it is. Agita actually didn't end up being too good in the sprint. Um, right. But he was good on the climb, actually. But yeah, it's Vingegaard leading Lander out. 
we think, could this be the day Lander wins a... Has he ever won? He has won a Bass Country stage before. He hasn't won a World Tour race for five years. Ooh. Last time was in 2018, a Tirreno stage. He beat Micah and Bennett in an uphill sprint. I think it was wow. Sassateto. Um, Good on the what, what bombs <laughs> there. And then his Basque, Pace Vasco stage when he beat Wilco uphill for shame um, by one second. This is the chance. Like, Vingegaard's got a good sprint, but he's been pulling the whole time. And Lander messes up this finish pretty badly. <laughs> There's a left-hand bend at about 200, 175 to go. Vingegaard keeps the pace high, and he takes first wheel through the corner. He goes all the way. He, usually, he goes outside, apex outside, as you would expect on this corner. He has no obligation to finish the corner and leave a huge gap open yep. to the barrier. Lander seems surprised by this because he tries to shoot immediately up the outside and there's no space. And then Vingard opens his sprint up and like he's sprinting faster than Lander. The only way Lander could have won this stage, perhaps, is a Cone Bowman Giro. <laughs> he had to dive bomb the corner. He had to dive bomb inside Vingard, brake check him off, and then win the sprint. Like Camner did to um Juanpe in the Etna finish as well. And he didn't do that and he he was kind of mad at himself, I think. Yeah, and we're looking at the sprint behind because like two seconds behind these riders, the group behind is sprinting with Schmidt destroying everybody in the sprint. I think uh, when it comes to the second spot, there's Sobrero, like you mentioned, in that group ahead of McNulty. So that is the top five. Vingegaard, Landa, Schmidt, Sobrero, McNulty. And then we get uh, the first EF rider, right? Which is not Carapaz because Carapaz is a total of... Three, three and a half mins back. Well, that backfired, didn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I don't really, like, would your plan be with Uran and Carapaz in their current shape to 1-2 Vingegaard on a 13% gradient? No, well, well, no, 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 no. It, it would be on <laughs> and the... And Uran's a good descender. Exactly, it would be on the, on the flatter part because you want Uran yeah. as close as possible for the descent to come and you don't want him to drop early by attacking early as well. So it's kind of like, they played it on the wrong place, and they also, in my opinion, focused a bit too much on Carapaz because I did feel like Uran was spacing for Carapaz for a bit on the climb, and nah, eventually Uran's attacked. the one finishing sixth. I think that was Uran attacking, but it just didn't <laughs> look that. No, but no, they're on a steep gradient. There's not, and Vingegaard's yeah. just in the wheel reacting. I think it was a genuine attack. I okay. just, yeah, just frankly terrible tactics. Um, and they got embarrassed like they did last weekend at Indorain. There's nothing more to say about that. Um, and they've thrown two guys even further out of GC than they needed to be. Particularly Ch Chavez is in good enough shape. He could have been in G1 today. Uh, sorry, the Schmidt group. Chavez has good enough legs that he did not need to lose 46 seconds today and yep. he would have been on a minute or whatever. But yeah, revised GC, Vingegaard is now 12 seconds out of Lander. So those three seconds are 25% of his, they took at the intermediate, or a decent part of his buffer. Gudu is on 31 seconds. Subero fourth, 33, same time as Zagiro. Let me have a look. There's no changes in the top seven in terms of positions. Yeah. Aaron Brew loses 10 spots. Bangioli loses wow. 10 spots. He's, um, he's just speaking for stage six, my man. Come on, he's doing this on purpose to give the others a chance. That's what Amburu is like, a big heart, but no, 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 no. He, he also didn't really do much for Moss, from what I could tell. Then again, I didn't see Moss too much, even though it felt like on the climb, he was kind of always in the background. And I don't know if Aramburu actually worked for him, but I would, I would enjoy Aramburu actually folding into a domestique role for once this week, because it's getting a bit embarrassing to support this guy. Jeez. <laughs> Danny Martinez loses another 46 seconds, so Ineos are kind of... They don't look like they have anyone on for top 10 in GC at this race. It's really looking like, well, Jayco have two within 40 seconds, Sobrera and Yates, who have been conspicuously hiding themselves. But the team is low-key strong with Harper as well. He could be lethal on the last stage. They're the only team, Am I right in saying with two riders in the top 10 in GC and Lander is by far the closest? So, yeah, 
I think Vingegaard's plan today was to create a bigger gap to the other guys, which he did by 15 or so seconds. And like we think, we keep saying, oh, stage six raid, stage six raid. Vingegaard's going to be under pressure. And he might be, like Remco was last year. And his team is vulnerable. But third is on 31 seconds. Tenth, no, ninth is on 39 seconds. I guarantee you when it comes to stage uh, six, guys will be defending fifth and fourth on their GC positions and it will benefit Vingegaard uh, in part. So, yeah, but he looks good, Vingegaard. Yep. Even with that long climbs, he looks, he looks good. Uh, it's unfortunate. Despite, yeah. Because, like, we're looking forward to the stage six, but the setup in GC is slowly but surely falling into a way where the setup for stage six might not be optimal to have GC riders go for long. So I hope it still changes around in the coming days. There's still terrain tomorrow where... Am I... It's, I don't know. I don't know if I can call tomorrow terrain where GC can sparkle up a lot. <laughs> yeah, it can. Tomorrow is super stage hard. Again. Tomorrow is harder than... It's harder than yesterday. It's a mural stage, no? Again? I mean, this is, let's get into it. Amor, Amorbieta, Echano, they do a loop again and finish 166 kilometers, and it is rampas inhumanas on the menu all day. We have, at the start, a few longer climbs, 4K, 6%, 4.5K, 7.7%, but that includes the start of the Peresi climb is 1.4Ks at 12%, and then there's just a 1K, 10% climb straight afterwards. There's then a staggered climb. I can't pronounce that one. That's that's beyond even me. And then they have the intermediate <laughs> sprint at Amor Amorebieta. I'm not sure if it's uh, Am Amorebieta is different to Amorebieta Echano. I've just learned. So that's not the finish line. And that's after a few climbs. And then they have three back to back 900 meters, 9%, 600 meters, 9.6%. And one kilometer seven percent, and the first four hundred meters are over ten percent, and that's about four and a half k's from the finish, the crest. So I think there's going to be GC action again, like yep. even on anywhere really. I think there's just going to be GC action, and I think Lander and Vingegaard are going to probably go clear again tomorrow. I also believe GC action will happen, but I kind of fear that GC's folded in a way where. I don't necessarily see an option for like a secondary GC rider to go from long, you know? The gaps in GC are still not gigantic though. We're talking about a minute, so that's what makes me feel a bit more happy about that. But the thing is, will a Buchmann go early on a stage like this? No, no. no. Not really, eh? And McNulty's the one. But he might be yeah, saving it. Exactly. He doesn't have a teammate close to him, so he's kind yeah. of throwing it all on the line if he does it. So that's the fear that I have when it comes to this stage. And that's why a scenario that could also happen is that we've got yesterday's scenario stage where they go get over these climbs and we're basically fighting on the last three hills, which would be really annoying and I hope it doesn't happen. So I'm hoping we see attacks with 30k to go, 35k to go on that un unpronounceable climb. If there was a better GC setup, I'd expect the attacks with probably not with 70k to go on that 11 percent um 1.4 70 kilometers in a gc stage is is quite early for a stage that doesn't have Pugaccio in it is it a land that would not do that i think if i was mcnulty i would go on the bellaringa bellarinaga climb 2.1k 6.6 percent that's the perfect gradient for him that yep. then gives him another little climb punchy one afterwards before a descent where he can take three bonus seconds at the intermediate he can then monster the false flat uphill valley and say it is really reduced before and there's the domestiques are thin on the ground then it could be you know him pulling against chavez or or somebody and he can really take time in that valley that should be a positive thing for him and then positioning i think is his maybe his problem into the base of the climb. So then entering the last three solo would be a huge advantage and he can ride his own pace. So McNulty's the one I'd be looking at. Maybe he's joined by somebody like a Carapaz. I don't know. But you're right. You need the team like Groshart and the Formulo and he or she to set it up uh, for you if that is your, your plan. But based on how this race is going, I think there will be more GC action and I think Fingergaard wins his third stage in a row, Benji. It's very much possible, and the thing is, he has Valter now as 
his prominent domestique on this type of terrain, I would say. I'd expect a Norman to be used earlier on to kind of like try and control a group or something like that, but he's not going to be there when shit hits the fan. And I think for Vingega, attack might be his best defense when the hills really start following up and we enter the last 35 kilometers. And then he will get people with him that will want to ride because Landa will want to secure a second if he's with him. And if anybody else is in there, they want to move up and will ride with him. So I see that happening. I see a potential scenario where Vingo wins once again three days in a row, but it's really boring to repeat exactly your words. So I'm going to say a completely different rider. I'm going to go for... I don't fucking know who can win this outside of Vingo. Let's say... Skelmose. <laughs> yeah, Skelmose looks really good. He was with McNulty when they were trying to counter on the shallower part. He's also got a sprint that he can beat Vingegaard in a sprint, that's for sure. So it's also descending is really important, as we've seen, and Lander and Vingegaard, I think, are well above average descenders. So that was Pace Vasco. Otherwise, there was the Cir uh, Circuit des Ardennes, which is, I wouldn't normally mention a 2.2, but it's a <laughs> under-23, it's not an under-23 race, but a lot of the under-23 riders do it from like Hagen, Sperm and Axion, the top teams. They have a ridiculous team here with... Um, Morgado, who is the one, Garrison, uh, Jan Christen, who is, I think both Morgado and Christen are supposed to be going to uh, UAE Team Emirates. But the first stage was won by Axel Laurence. And I'm just thinking, I think you mentioned this before, Benji, why this guy's won a pro race. I'm not criticizing Laurence, to be clear here. I'm not criticizing him. He's won a stage at Croatia race last year. He came second in Britannia Classic. Yep which is a world tour one day race. I know it's not Ken Vavelhem, but he got beaten only by Wout van Aert. It's a 200 and how long? It's a 256k hilly classic yep. and he came second. And he's riding the Circuit, Circuit des Ardennes against <laughs> guys on U23 dev teams. Like I don't What's going on? Yeah, like, like his rider is decently proper enough to be in world tour races with world tour teams that's 100 percent. this Above guy can average ride world tour rider exactly this this guy can win a an uphill sprint in in a romandy whatever something like that i think that's possible he can compete in those uphill sprints i would say he could have and won the scaling stage he could have 100 he could have won races here and if we look at that kind of rider he's in their dev team because well they're kind of cheating between brackets it's legal so it's not really cheating but they're they're trying to get more people than their world tour roster can allow by putting them in the u23 team and therefore have an expanded roster now it's unfortunate because not only does it send him to races that he probably is too too good for for the secret as an end but it also takes away opportunities from riders like henry ulik for example do the second in this he's literally working for for laurence in this race he probably let out him for, for this finish, and the thing with Uli is he got third, I think, in in the uh, Hendrevelgem U23 as well. He's a really talented guy, German rider. I've been following him for a few years, and he just did his police academy, German police academy, over the over the winter, so therefore started the year late, and he's still so bloody good already from, from the second that the season kicks off, so I'm expecting this guy to keep progressing, and it wouldn't shock me if this guy's on, on Walter Alperson in the coming years, just as much as Laurens is, for example, because while Laurens beat everybody, he beat everybody else except for Laurens. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to see what he does as well. Uh, Laurens does have a contract, it must be said, for next year with Alperson de Koenig. I don't know how, it, because he rode for B&B, which is a pro Conti team, and then they folded, and that was his neo pro contract. They didn't have to give him the two and a half year or whatever it is minimum world tour contract. So, for a guy who I don't know who was leaking it last year, it's it's one of two things. Either because you remember when BNB folded, apparently every world tour team wanted to give Axel Laurence a million euros, and I was like, eh, okay, million. he's good, but there's a little bit too much hype here. Quick step and tried. Then, pardon. Quick step tried. How they try? They they tried getting Laurence. I I don't know the details, but I I am very certain that they tried getting Laurence. Well, they mustn't have been very good at trying because he's <laughs> riding for a Conti dev team at Circuit de Zardenne. So, 
whoever's their scouting or recruitment person, maybe they don't know how to send an email properly or, but yeah, um, I guess like they tried to sign climbing support for Remco. Um, but anyway, yeah, there was all that hype. And then he goes to the dev team. I'm thinking, well, now it's swung too far the other way. Like, really? He's French? 21? Second Britannia Classic? And, and Cofidis? Or Asia? Like, he's better than, what, 25 guys on Age 2 are? <laughs> I'm not joking. Probably. It's, it's actually shocking, In but probably. In terms of capability to win a and even, dot pro stage. He's better than... 20 riders of Alpecin, I would say. It's crazy. The B&B fallout, it's just like with Gazprom. Piccolo was available, and I was like, come on, this is a gift. He had to go to Androni for three months, then EF, credit to them, picked him up. He scored like 700 UCI points. The B&B fallout, Nick Schultz, second in the TDF stage, is on a one year at Israel, and Laurence on a dev team, it's like, Teams just get so fixed in they have their what they were doing. And listen, I understand there's no roster spots. You've got contracts done. You don't have the money. I understand that. But just surprising to me. Uh, anyway, that was just a note on Circuit des Ardennes. If Morgado wins by 30 seconds, we'll mention it in the, another day. Uh, but that's all from us today. Pays Vasco, big stage tomorrow. And we'll have the recap of it then. Till then, ciao.